Summers. I'm Senior Director of Lifelong Learning and Travel at the Yale Alumni Association. And for those of you who are familiar with our programs, you will notice that we have recently become Yale Alumni Academy and that Yale Educational Travel has been closed and transitioned into our Alumni Academy programs. Um, there are some things that are different and some things that are the same. Uh, as far as what's the same, you can expect the same quality travel experience, the same great interaction with faculty, the same amazing international destinations. As far as what's different, um, we are looking forward to offering more variety in our pricing to make our travel programs accessible across a different spectrum of alumni. Um, and we are also looking to work more closely with our faculty so that we really have programs that are designed around the learning agenda that faculty want to share with all of you. And with that in mind, we have two members of our faculty with us today, Ed Kamins and um, Rod McIntosh are gonna talk to us uh, briefly about the trips that they are leading upcoming. So we'll do a deep dive on two trips. We're gonna do an overview on a variety of trips, um, but I wanna kick it off with talking about a lot of the questions that I've received over the past couple of months. As we start to think about traveling again soon in the future, people have asked me lots of things and I thought it would just be good to get us all together and talk about some of those questions. So I wanna go through the most common questions. And then if you have uh, more specific questions, please feel free to post those in the Q&A box and I will cover um, all of them at the end of the session after our faculty uh, present. I also wanna say hello to Per and Helena from Portugal. So Portugal and Italy, those are our furthest flung destinations today. All right, well, let's get right into talking about some of the questions that have come up. Um, I'm sharing with you my screen and it's just a little, there we go. Uh, I, I wanted to show you our new website. So one of the things that's happened during COVID, I know all of you have been on our website, but I just want to call it out is we've launched a new website for Alumni Academy. On our homepage, you'll see this box here that says discover your next adventure. And that leads you to a page which has an overview of all the programs that are currently confirmed for 2021 and 2022. We're adding programs periodically, so you may see some things change on that page, but it, right from alumniacademy.yale.edu, you see this Mexican uh, pyramid here, and from that button, you can get to our landing page, which has all of our uh, confirmed travel programs on it. For 2021 and 2022, you can expect over 40 different travel programs featuring domestic and international destinations. And you see here the menu that is on our travel preview page. It basically will take you to anywhere in the world that you wanna go and see what programs we have running. So each of these is a button that you can click and it takes you right to the section that shows you all the trips in that part of the world. So just to show you some really brief highlights and give you a sense of the scale that we are um, covering, we have in June of 2022, a Danube River cruise. I'm really excited about this circumnavigation of the Black Sea. I think the Black Sea is a fascinating part of the world. You get that sort of gateway from Europe to Asia and so many places there that people have never, uh, never been, like Bulgaria is somewhere that's on my bucket list for sure. And then there's Prague to Berlin on the Elbe Princess. Uh, in spring or fall of 2021 or 2022. So in some cases, the dates for the trips are not confirmed and you'll just see there a general idea of when we think that trip will take place. Um, just highlighting a couple of things in Africa. I know now that COVID is clearing up, a lot of us are eager to go to those places that we've been dreaming about and maybe seemed a little bit complicated or maybe we'll get there one day and now we realize one day may never come if we don't take the chance to go. So I'm really excited about our Tanzania program during the Great Migration in the winter of 2022. Um, our Pride of Africa, 
program uh, features South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. This is a very popular itinerary because you get to see so many uh, different countries. And then cruising the Nile, this is one, one of the last trips that I did before the quarantine started um, in February of 2019. One of my last international big trips was going on the Nile. And I was so glad that I got to do that because I've been drawing on those travel memories um, during this last year to keep me going. So I, I really am encouraging you if you haven't considered going to Egypt, it's a fantastic destination. And then there's some, some of the new things that we're doing are just featuring a few places that are closer to home because as we um, make our way through this transitional period, we know that people may not want to go um, to the far-flung international destinations. So a couple of programs that we have coming up domestically um, that I think will be really interesting. And one that I especially want to highlight is the civil rights program, which goes to um, uh, Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi and takes a look at, especially Alabama, I don't know if people realize, but they've recently applied for UNESCO status. Um, they have so many fascinating new museums there. So there's quite a lot to see. And this civil rights uh, tour ties into a virtual tour series that's on our website now and accessible, um, looking all at the history of civil rights in the US. So here are some of the common questions that people have been asking me um, when I answer the phone and I talk to a lot of you on the phone or um, when I've exchanged emails with a lot of you, uh, people have asked me these four types of questions and I'm gonna go over the answers to each one of them. Uh, I wanna get to Anita's question just before I continue, is winter 2022, January, um, and February or December, Anita, it, winter 2022 is um, January and February, not December. So hopefully that helps with that question. So these are the four questions people have asked. Obviously we all wanna know when is it going to be um, viable to travel again in the way that we did before, um, keeping in mind that it will be a new normal. Uh, how will we decide if it's safe to travel? What will the protocols be for uh, COVID-19 safety on our travel programs? And the very important one, what if I change my mind um, at the last minute? What if the trip is postponed? What happens then? So I wanna cover all of these questions. First, we'll start with when will travel resume? That's an easy one. If I can get my screen to progress. Oh, I went too far, let me try again. There we go. Um, so when will travel resume? What we anticipate based on uh, a number of different factors, which I'll get to in a minute, is September to, between September and December this year, we expect that the first Yale sponsored trips will be able to operate. Um, there are people who have signed up on trips that are departing this summer. We don't anticipate that Yale is going to be able to sponsor those trips, but we are still um, honoring those registrations for people who want to travel directly with the tour company. It just means that there will not be a Yale faculty leader on that trip and it will not be an official Yale trip. And some people, for example, on our summer Iceland program have decided to continue on. Some people on our summer Alaska program have decided to continue on. And that's an individual uh, decision. So in terms of Yale sponsored trips where we send a faculty member, we think there are two target windows um, that we can feel relatively confident uh, travel will resume. The first target window is September to December of 2021. And um, it, with all things progressing the way that they are, that seems likely. Um, if that isn't likely, if that works out not to be likely, we anticipate that really by January, um, travel will be viable again. That's our best estimation right now based on a number of factors. And I wanna get to those factors next. So how will we decide if it's safe to travel? There are a variety of factors that we consider. 
we consider these factors first and foremost with Yale's leadership. Yale has a task force at the university that is responsible for looking at all the variables related to the pandemic and making decisions about what activities are safe and authorized for all Yale affiliates. And so we look at that and um, that comes out to us in two ways. It comes out in the form of a travel policy that the university dictates. Um, right now, the university's travel policy for the spring and summer is that faculty, students, and staff are allowed to travel domestically and internationally at their own discretion, following all of the CDC guidelines and safety policies. So um, that's the first factor that we look at. The second factor that we look at is what does the university say about groups of people getting together? And right now the university is saying, um, recommending no more than 20 people gather together. And so with those two pieces of information, we've decided that we're not going to sponsor travel for the summer because we would look for the um, university policy to include a much larger group of people. So even though our tours tend to be around 20 to 25 people, if we're on a cruise ship, for example, if people are getting on planes, um, if people are dining in restaurants, certainly there may be more people around and we want a larger group size to consider um, the circumstances that we would be in for group travel, as well as the size of our specific groups. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, we really want to see the university adopt a larger group size for gatherings before we return to travel. And the university makes announcements periodically to changes in its policy, just in the same way that the CDC or the WHO would. Um, so we expect a number, another announcement in the summer, and that will give us a much better sense of what our guidance is for the fall. The next thing that we consider is the CDC guidelines, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, obviously, CDC guidelines change depending on the region of the world that you're visiting. So for each trip, we're evaluating the guidelines, not only for Americans traveling domestically, but also for Americans traveling to that particular destination. And then the next thing that we do is we work with travel partners on the ground in each of the countries that our programs visit. And we consult with those travel partners to find out what their experience on the ground is pointing to, what the policies are that are in place of those governments in the countries that we're visiting, um, what the terms that the travel partners are able to uphold with regard to um, pro protocols for safety, testing, vaccination, all of that information we take into consideration. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at the policies for border crossing. So we wanna make sure that you can, if you sign up for a trip and the trip goes forward, that you can get into the country and mo most importantly as well, that you can return back home. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're very certain about border cro crossing policies before we go ahead with a trip. So that's really, those are really the, um, the terms that we consider for travel. I see Gregory asking, how open do you think uh, Portugal will be by October of 2021? It's really been my experience throughout this pandemic not to predict anything because that's how sure you, uh, that's when you can be sure you'll be wrong. Um, it has changed so rapidly, um, but from what I have seen, what I'm encouraged by is that the different health organizations are doing a very thorough job of tracking variants. There seems to be an increased rate of the ability to track cases, both case numbers in particular countries and individual cases. Um, there seems to be much more consistency across the travel industry with regard to protocols for testing frequency of their staff and their patrons as well as testing um, or as well as quarantine facilities and quarantine policies. So I'm seeing a stabilizing in the travel industry of best practices and that's making me feel more confident. And I'm also seeing um, a much greater ability of national health organizations to track and manage uh, the, the 
um, evolution of the pandemic in their countries. And so that's making me feel confident that there will be European destinations that are likely safe to visit in the fall, but I can't really pinpoint one particular place and say that, you know, with any kind of certainty, um, exactly what the case is going to be. So I wanted to share these details, these kind of six points with you so that you can see what goes into our decision-making and how closely and carefully we're considering all the factors. So with that in mind, I will go to the next question. Let me see if I can get my screen to advance. Okay. There's one here. So what if I change my mind or if the trip is postponed? And I think this is really important to cover. Um, what we've done is we've negotiated with each of our travel partners. So whatever tour company is operating the trip, it does not matter. The policy is the same across the board. At 90 days, Yale will share with you what our decision is, whether or not that trip is viable to go forward based on the six points that I've just covered in terms of our criteria for deciding if it's safe to travel. So we'll inform you of the decision at the 90 day point. At that same 90 day point, you can cancel your participation in a travel program for any reason. Just you changed your mind, you don't feel like going, you got cold that morning and you decided you don't wanna to go to a cold place. Whatever your reason is, it does not matter up till 90 days before departure, you can withdraw from the trip and you will receive compensation in the form that you made your deposit. So if you made a new cash deposit in 2021, you will receive that cash deposit refunded to you. If you used a credit to register or if you rolled over on a credit from a 2020 trip, you will receive that credit returned back to you and made available for you to use again. And I will say that what I'm noticing just across the board is that tour operators are being willing to extend those credits um, into the future. So if it looks like you had a credit that's expiring in at the end of 2021, that credit will be extended to 2022. Um, and then the other thing is you don't need to pay anything except for your deposit up until 90 days. So there is no second payment due aside from your, in most cases, $1,000 deposit up until 90 days. After 90 days, that's when your next payment comes due. So what happens if after the 90 day point, you change your mind? That 90 day point is really critical because that's what we've negotiated on your behalf as a way out for you. If after 90 days you change your mind, then you are agreeing to move forward with whatever the tour company's terms and conditions are at that point. So it gives you a chance to really familiarize yourself with those terms and conditions before the 90 day point, and then you can make a decision as to whether you want to stay on that trip. Hopefully that answers a lot of the questions um, about, you know, what you can basically feel completely comfortable registering for any trip if you are outside of 90 days and knowing that you can withdraw that trip. And that's really what we wanna reassure you of. With that in mind, I wanna welcome our first faculty um, guest today. And I was about to say presenter, but he's not really presenting. He's really talking to us about um, this trip, which has been a long time in the works. And it's one of the first trips that we have going forward on land in 2021, October 9th through October 18th, the origins of man in Southwest France and Northern Spain, led by Professor Rod McIntosh. Welcome, Rod. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you, Lauren. <laughs> I know you're as excited about traveling as we are. How has it been the past year not being able to go anywhere? It's not been very pleasant at all. <laughs> this last year, I had trips planned to Peru, to South Africa, to Senegal, uh, and, and China, and they were all can canceled. So that, there went my research. research. <laughs> there you go. So, well, um, we're really thrilled and honored that this will be hopefully one of your first trips of 2021. And I just thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about the trip and help people to learn a bit more about um, why you're excited about, uh, about leading this trip. 
So I'll start with, um, with a question for those who don't know you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the Yale trips that you've been on over the years? Sure, sure. So I've really gone to three quite different parts of, of the world. The first, I've had a couple of trips in the Mediterranean, in central Mediterranean. The highlight of that was seeing Carthage. Um, I'm an archaeologist, so Carthage and Rome, they're, they're central places. And then we did the islands of Greece. And the highlight of that, of course, was Santorini, um, the, the, the uh, 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 famous uh, Mediterranean site. Uh, this is the third time that I've gone to the Dordogne uh, in southeast uh, 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 France, um, although I've been going there for 30, 30 years. Um, and it's, it's a spectacular area for rock art. Every cave that we go to is completely different with its, with its rock art. Um, it's a classic area for the later Paleolithic uh, archaeological sites, and we go to those as well. But it's, it's a place with wonderful food and uh, really, really welcoming people. And then one of my research areas is South Africa. I'm, I am, a, as well as a faculty member at, at Yale, I'm a faculty member at the University of Pretoria. So the, the three South African tours we've done, number one, we go to a variety of different safari situations with very different ecologies, very different animals. Um, but also we go to a number of archeological sites, some of which have the earliest expressions of Homo sapiens sapiens, us. So it's a it's an it's an opportunity to talk about the conditions, ecological conditions, the climate conditions that led to the emergence of humanity. I, I know I traveled with you in the Dordogne. Yes. That was one of my first trips that I did with Yale. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I have here an archaeologist that I get to ask all the questions about these um, amazing cave paintings. Uh, and I want to just share a little bit about the, the trip so that people can see um, what it's like. This, this village of Sarlat in, um, in the Bordeaux region of France, I wonder if you can say um, what you like about visiting and staying in the village there. Well, it's the hotel is right in the middle of the of the the village, so you're there seeing people's activities in daily life and the Wednesday, I guess it was the, the Wednesday market. But historically, it's a really very important um, place because it was one of the free towns. So during the medieval period, it wasn't under the control of the barons or the or the lo lords, and so. Really, you can talk about the beginnings of not just uh, crafts, but the whole beginnings of, of um, sort of the mo modern world coming out of these free towns in Europe at the, at the, at the time. And what, one of the things I loved about it was that it's this medieval walled town, and it, it feels like you're going back in time. It's almost perfectly preserved to what it would have been in its original um, original days and just walking through the town. It's such a kind of peaceful, relaxing experience, but you also feel on this program in particular, you feel like you're, you're living there um, right. rather than just like a tourist. And we ate some pretty good food too. <laughs> we ate some pretty good food. I left the pictures of the ducks off of this presentation, but this village is known as the global destination right. for foie gras. Right. <laughs> so that's one thing I can't forget about it. You mentioned the paintings, and um, I wanted to share one of the one of the uh, caves that we go to. Um, what do you, What do you find for you? What do you find most fascinating about the cave art in this region? Well, I think it's the the issue is the the diversity of the art. So we have we have art from uh, almost a twenty thousand year period. Every cave that's selected for this, this tour has very different um, kind of art. And it allows me to talk about the issue that, that uh, most fascinates me about this period in prehistory, which is how did we become, how did we become human? How did we get our consciousness? What does it mean that Neanderthals apparently never made rock art? And it's only when we, 
modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens came in. And so you, it, it allows us to talk about one of the fundamental issues is what makes us different from everybody else, from all the other animals, all the other hominids, uh, what is, and who apparently didn't have the same ability to have a self-conscious sense of, of self. So we really get to explore that issue, but also in the context of just this really spectacularly, aesthetically fascinating art. It's really quite astonishing when you're there to imagine that, you know, it was millennia upon millennia ago. And, um, and when you see the artistic uh, skill and facility of, of these paintings, you, you just can't wrap your mind around it until you're there. Right. Um, but, and it's wonderful to have your, your lec lectures um, in tandem with the visit to really kind of put us in the, in the right archeological context. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question that came in um, from Anne and she wants to know, do you visit Lasco or the copy Lasco two? And actually, Anne, you visit both places. Well, we visit uh, Lasco four, so mm -hmm. in fact they're on the third, the third copy. No one can get into the original Lasco, and that's to preserve the paintings. Um, but Lasco, Lasco four is the best of the copies. I've been to, I've been to Lasco, and I've been to all four of, uh, all three of the copies. They've done a really very good job of reproducing the sense of the place as well. And then there's a interpretive center, a museum afterwards that allows you to go into, into more depth into what scholars think about the, 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 that the rock art means um, and also, also into what life was like during the, in this case, the later part of the Paleolithic. Wonderful. And this, um, some people may have been on this trip before, um, but this one is a little bit different because of the places that we stop uh, on this trip and particularly because this trip combines France with Spain. And so there's a visit through the Basque region. Um, there's a stop in this, in this uh, city of Toulouse. I believe there's one day in Toulouse on this itinerary um, and then going into the Basque country. And um, I wonder, Rod, have you been to this region as well? I no, didn't I visit it with you. Right, right. No, I haven't, and I, I'm, I'm ready for the big competition. Which is the best food, French food or Basque food? Because I, <laughs> I've had Basque food in San Francisco and in Boston, and it's really wonderful food. So, uh, I, I don't think we'll tell the locals our decision, but I'm looking looking forward <laughs> to that. But also, there's a whole set of rock art sites in Basque country and in in, um, in Spain that I've never seen. I've taught them, but I've never seen them. And I'm really looking forward to Atapuerca in Spain because that's, that's one of the key sites in the world for understanding how we became our, ourselves. It's very, very early, 400,000 years. There's skulls and the, the rest of the skeletons of or, uh, of the, the predecessors to either Neanderthals or to modern humans in, in there as, as well. So I just can't wait to, 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 to see Atapuerca. And have you been to Bilbao? I have not, nope. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, you have a day on this trip, a free day in Bilbao, um, which of course has this fantastic um, museum. And what mm -hmm. I loved about uh, looking at the, the city, although I haven't been, is the contrast between old and new. Right, um, right. And I rode for, for Yale, so I'm very happy to see a, to see a, 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 a quad there. Well, and that reminds me, actually, on the, um, on, the, on the Dordogne trip, there were people who decided that they wanted to do a little bit of kayaking. And so you have an opportunity in free time on these trips to get out and explore the countryside, to see the city, to taste the food. Um, you have the combination of the medieval uh, villages and the modern cities, smaller towns and regions in Spain and France that you might not necessarily get to on a 
sort of main tour. So um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight a little bit about, about this program and thank you for sharing, Rod, what okay. you're excited about. Um, I wonder if you have any suggestions or recommendations if people wanna read up on this topic um, yes. for books or articles or things they might read. Yes, the, the, the absolute classic and very accessible, very readable is by my old friend, Paul Bond, B-A-H-N. And that's called Journey Through the Ice Age. So Paul mm. Bond, Journey Through the Ice Age. If you're interested in this whole issue of how, how we think of consciousness, how we think of what makes humans different than anyone else, there's a really great book by Alpert, A-L-P-E-R-T, Barbara Alpert, and it's called The Creative Ice Age Brain. So again, Barbara Alpert, The Creative Ice Age Brain. And then if you're interested in, and it's a very accessible article, in how archeologists go into caves and see what they see, there's an article by Bruno David, D-A-V-I-D, um, and it's in the journal American Scientist. It's uh, the July and August issue of 2019. It's called Giving Context to Rock Art. But if you go onto the, the American Scientist webpage, you can call that up and they'll give you a free, a free article. So you, don't, you, you can access it without subscribing to the, to the, to the journal. And tell, uh, remind me what um, what year did you say? It's June, Listen, July, or June, uh, July, August of 2019. Okay, great. Thank you for those recommendations. I think that's it's wonderful to have a chance to read and really immerse yourself in the topic before you go on the trip. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. lots of people from our audience here on the on the trip. The, in some ways, the best part of any of these Yale trips, and this will be my seventh or eighth, is the, is the people you meet. Um, people are in the mood to, to learn, to have a good time, to maybe drink some good wine, and uh, the fellowship is always spectacular. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Rod. I know you have another meeting that you have right. to get to, and I really appreciate you taking time to chat with us today. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. See you in France. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to go next to Professor Ed Kamins, who is joining us to talk about a trip that he is planning together with us to, um, to Japan. And just before I go to you, Professor Kamins, um, I just want to acknowledge a couple of people have asked about um, whether or not vaccinations will be required by us to travel on the programs. And right now, our answer to that is yes. Um, we are expecting that people will have a vaccination before they travel on our programs this fall. Um, we are also, again, working with Yale to develop that policy, um, working with our tour partners because they will also have terms and conditions and policies and looking at the requirements of the countries and the um, locations in those countries, hotels, et cetera, that we're going to visit. Um, so I'll go into that in more detail after we speak with Professor Kamins, because I want to give you um, an overview of all the things to expect with our COVID protocols. And I want to leave time for um, lots of questions, any further questions that you all may have. But before I do that, I want to welcome Professor Ed Kamins. Thank you for joining us um, and talk about Japan. So let me get to, there we are. Uh, the trip that you are hosting in 2022, January 29th to February 9th, Japan in winter and the Sapporo Snow Festival and Snow Monkeys. So um, I'll turn over to you, Ed. I just would love to know, how did you come up with this idea? Why, why were you interested in sharing this with Yale alumni? Well, because it's totally different from any other experience I will have had in Japan. And I suspect very different from any experience that any of our travelers may have had previously if they've been in Japan. 
uh, or elsewhere. Um, because of the geographical spread that we're, we've conceived of going first uh, up to Hokkaido, take advantage of what goes on there uh, in the natural world and also in the city of Sapporo, this famous snow festival, and then down to Nagano, uh, the Japanese Alps, uh, to see those macaques that we see uh, in the picture on the lower left. Um, we had uh, planned a trip of similar nature uh, for a couple of years back that then did have to be postponed because of the pandemic. And I'm very excited that we've been able to revive it. Uh, and with the addition of the, uh, uh, sec the excursion to see the cranes uh, uh, um, in uh, Northern Hokkaido doing their famous uh, seasonal dance, which is I think something to, to be seen uh, that is a uh, once in a lifetime experience. I just wanna say also, um, I'm coming to you today, uh, to, to you today, my background is a painting uh, based on the tale of Genji, which is in the Yale University Art Gallery, but I'm actually in Los Angeles, the uh, traditional home of the Gabrieleno and Tongva peoples. I think many of us have gotten used to making these uh, so-called uh, land statements, land acknowledgement statements in, in our public presentations, but it's not entirely not apropos to the idea of this trip in that um, Hokkaido, as I'm sure many know, is the homeland of Japan's indigenous Ainu people. And uh, they, uh, there are very few I knew left, uh, only a few hundred thousand, but uh, their culture is uh, alive. And I'm excited. One of the things I'm excited about with respect to this trip is the uh, opportunity to, to experience their culture. And so when you gave the land acknowledgement, Professor Caymans, are you saying that the same group of people are in were present in California or were you acknowledging no, a different no, no. group? A different group, the, the, the hereditary uh, uh, natives uh, of this region around Los Angeles were the Gabrieleno, also known as Tongva peoples. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we can talk more about that, but the uh, Ainu uh, have a long and troubled history, uh, but I, I can't think of Hokkaido uh, separately from thinking about the history of the Ainu people, which is part of the history of Japan. We think of it, the Japanese, as a, an island, uh, an archipelago, archipelagic peoples, uh, but their, um, uh, their own uh, genetic history is extremely complicated uh, with roots both in uh, Central Asia and throughout Polynesia, very complex, but they were not the first people there. Wow, I, I think that's something that's not commonly known right. or spoken right. about right. In, in mainstream culture for sure. This is one of the reasons I, I bring it up because, and uh, when we talk briefly about the readings I'm recommended, we can come back to this. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I, and I, I always enjoy talking to you because I think that um, unless you are a specialist in Asia, it's something that so few of us learn about in our sort of Western education. And, yeah. um, it, and it gives you a whole different way to think about the world. And this trip is very new for me. We're, we're showing slide, a slide of Tokyo. I've been there many times, many, many times. I spent a lot of time there. There aren't too many nights or days of the year when you get a view of uh, Mount Fuji like this, but it, in, in February, it just could happen. Uh, but um, this trip is very different from the others uh, that I have done uh, for Yale travel in the past. Uh, I did a trip to Kyoto, Japan, um, which had as its central theme, the aforementioned uh, Tale of Genji, this great work of fiction from the early 11th century. And then we did a trip around Northern Japan following the path of the great haiku poet, uh, Basho. Uh, so those trips were focused on 
classical Japanese literature, which is the area of my scholarship. This trip really has more of its focus on natural history and history. Uh, and that's another aspect for which uh, I'm very excited. Okay. Well, I wanted to highlight um, a couple of the places on the trip. Speaking of that, yeah. I, obviously it starts in Tokyo and you, you spoke to us about the dancing cranes. Yes. Um, and I think it's hard to imagine that if you haven't, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with it. So I love this picture because it really gives a sense yes. of, of the motion yes. and, the, and the beauty of the animals. Right, this is something I've had in my mind's eye uh, all my adult life, maybe before that, uh, but uh, have never seen. And uh, so it's really going to be quite an experience, I'm sure. And, and, I, and, and it's, I want to, I want to um, build around it um, discussion among the participants, and I'm going to be learning more about this myself, about uh, conservation, uh, natural land preservation, species preservation, and the like. These the very high consciousness about these matters in Japan, as in many other parts of the world. Uh, yet, of course, the, many of these natural populations are endangered by, by growth, uh, economic growth and expansion, which is also, of course, the story of modern Japan. Right, right. And I think one of the highlights of this trip is that you get to see a lot of the natural landscape, as yes. you said. Yes. Um, yes. Here is the, it's Lake Hokkaido. Yes, uh, Lake Akan in Hokkaido. Uh, Lake Akan mm -hmm. in Hokkaido, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of the places that um, we stop. And I wonder if you could tell people just a little bit about what happens in Sapporo at the festival there. Right. Um, so throughout the uh, uh, several major neighborhoods of the central part of the city of Sapporo, uh, known for its beer. And yes, that's something else to look forward to. Um, there are these elaborate uh, constructions made of snow and ice. They take what uh, Yale Dining has been famous for with its ice sculptures to a whole new uh, dimension. Uh, uh, this happens to be a, a replica of a traditional Japanese castle. And as I understand it, one can simply stroll through the city, preferably at night uh, where everything is illuminated to see this extraordinary craft. And uh, I think we'll have a lot of company there and it will be very interesting to see since this uh, event of course had to be uh, canceled in the past year, uh, how um, the, uh, I think the enthusiasm for it will be heightened more than ever. Well, and I imagine even during normal times that it draws people yes. from all over yes. the world. That, that's right. It's quite a remarkable event. I, I love the contradiction between these two, this sculpture and ice, and then here we have the real thing. Yes. And just yes. noting how realistic the ice sculpture is and how beautiful the real thing is as well. Yes, and I must also say uh, that uh, just as with the, um, uh, your picture of Bill Bao, we see uh, a, uh, uh, looks like a, a radio transmitting tower or wireless uh, tower uh, looming there at about the same height, if not higher uh, than the castle. And this, this really is the story of Japan. Um, I frankly don't know if the, uh, but we'll find out. Many of these castles uh, in the cities of Japan are replicas. Uh, it may well be that the one uh, in Nagano uh, is original and has been restored. Well, and um, I also want to speak to this uh, this town of or this city of Nagano because I believe it's in the what, what's what's considered the Japanese Alps. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. and many will remember it was the site of uh, uh, Winter Olympics uh, some decades ago, uh, a very successful event and. Uh, we'll be watching to see how uh, the uh, Summer Olympics postponed uh, goes uh, this summer, but this is, as you can imagine, something that the Japanese remain very proud of, their participation in the international Olympic movement uh, and um, their hosting capabilities, which uh, are world-renowned. Well, and uh, 
and I believe it is has asked if there will be time for skiing because of course if you go to a winter olympics uh, town in the alps you want to see you want to, uh, ski. to ski uh well i think that might have to be an extension right um, i think so uh, too um uh but it would be good once you're yes once you're in the alps or or in hokkaido go early and ski in uh in uh, hokkaido but then you'll you'll miss out on our day in Tokyo, which I have to interject and say will be very special because we have been able well in advance to secure the uh, participation uh, uh, in a, a meeting with our group of Motoko Rich, a Yale alum, who is the New York Times bureau chief in Tokyo. And she will be able to join us uh, for a discussion about Japan today. Oh, excellent. That's really Japan, Japan in February um 20, 2022 yes yeah and it's always great to get that perspective especially when you start a trip out because of yes. course when you land there you have so many questions that you didn't realize yes. you were going to want to ask Japan is a place uh where the pace of change is so fast uh that keeping up with the way things are changing and development developing along with the ways that things are staying much as they have always been is um, a constantly uh, intriguing set of questions. I wanted to um, speak to another highlight, especially yes. since we've spoken about conservation. Yes, um, yes. So the, the the Japanese snow monkeys, they are macaques. Uh, and um, for a long time, I thought that they were a type of ape, but they are not. Uh, the macaques are monkeys. Uh, they do look a lot like baboons. I encountered them the first time I ever went to Japan uh, in, in the uh, western outskirts of the city of Kyoto. I was a high school exchange student, and there was a small shrine I could walk to uh, that was known for the fact that the monkeys would come down out of the hills uh, and uh, uh, interact with uh, tourists. Um, the snow monkeys are famous because they do uh, live uh, in the coldest parts of Japan. They love to come down to the hot springs. We're going to be visiting, I think, two hot springs uh, resorts, one in Hokkaido, one in Nagano. Uh, I don't think they'll be in the same pool with us, but I think we'll be seeing them in a reserve. Yeah, that would be sort of awkward to be in the pool with the. Yes, yes. <laughs> you would not want to do that. No. <laughs> They, 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 I believe they're generally not as friendly or sleepy as they look in this picture. <laughs> One wants to be wary of them. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll be observing from a safe distance. Nope, but no I know petting. And nope, and no petting of cranes either. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, um, Professor Caymans. Yes. I know people um, who are interested in this topic are certainly going to want to learn more about it. And you have yeah. shared a reading list with us. Yeah. So um, as I just, yes, so um, I think we're going to put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, I'm, I'm a scholar of literature. And one of the first books uh, I ever read of modern Japanese fiction uh, is thematically appropriate for our trip, since as I just mentioned, we're going to two different hot spring spas, and perhaps the most famous uh, modern Japanese novel set in a hot springs resort um, is uh, Kawabata Snow Country. And we are indeed going to Snow Country. Uh, it is a truly great novel. Um, Side and Sticker's translation is in print and easily accessible. I listed three books by former Yale History Department colleagues the late Connie Totman and Brett Walker, who now teaches at the University of Montana. These are books that focus on the um, natural history of Japan. Um, Connie's famous book, studying the history of forestry and forest conservation uh, within the context of uh, modern Japanese development and shifts in agricultural policy uh, is a landmark book uh, and um, well worth our reading for background of what we will be seeing in Hokkaido and Nagano. Um, Brett's one of his first and most uh, 
uh, acclaimed books was a study of um, the extirpation, the extinction of the wolves of Japan. Now you might not think of Japan associated with wolves. We think about them in, in the black forest of, of Germany or perhaps for that matter, uh, Alaska and Montana. But um, there was a, a large population of wolves in Japan and the Japanese word for them is okami um, and they are gone. Mm. Uh, how did they come to be lost? Uh, an earlier uh, book of Brett's was his study of the colonization of Hokkaido by the mainland Japanese, um, the conquest of Asian lands, starting at the end of the 16th century and continuing into the early modern period. Um, and finally, uh, at the end of our trip, we're going to one of Japan's most ancient, uh, most important uh, uh, Buddhist monastery temple complexes outside of the major metropoles, Kyoto, Nara, uh, Tokyo, uh, at Zenkoji. And uh, the most uh, famous book that is a study of its history and its art is by a late uh, Jap art, art historian from UCLA, just up the road from where I'm speaking to you from, uh, Don McCallum. So these will be some of the readings I'll share and there will be more titles to come so that people can do their homework before we get on that plane for Tokyo. Well, and since we have so much time, we have a, a lot of opportunity to really become immersed in these topics. So thank you yes. for um, sharing yes. this early reading list with us. And thank you for all the thought and care that you put into helping to develop this itinerary. It's been my great pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm very eagerly looking forward to this experience like everyone um, uh, itching to get on the road, or get in the air. Um, we talked earlier about previous experiences with EL travel. And as a few travelers uh, on the call uh, know, um, uh, I noted the names of uh, Pam and Bob and Linda. If there are others whose names I didn't recognize when I looked through the participants list, hello to you all. Uh, if you're veterans of the many trips I did with my wife, Mary Miller throughout Latin America, and especially in Mexico, and those two previous trips in Japan. But just as Rob, Rob said, uh, one of the tip top benefits of working with Yale Travel has been getting to know people who have been, been, become such wonderful friends over the years. And I look forward to making new ones. You can never have enough, right? No, <laughs> no, not, not enough Yale friends, certainly. They're all so fascinating um, and great people to travel with and great people to enjoy yeah. really interesting conversations with. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you, Professor Caymans. Yes. I appreciate you joining us on this Zoom call. Um, for everyone else, please stay on. We're going to just highlight a few more trips and uh, answer all of the questions that I have not had a chance to answer and all those questions you have not asked yet. Should I stay for a moment and find out if there are any specific questions for me, Lauren? Sure, yeah, feel free to hang on, Professor Caymans. Mm -hmm. um, but we appreciate your time, so want to be mindful mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So I want to go forward and I'll just um, highlight a couple of additional trips that we have that I think are really interesting. And I've heard from quite a few people um, that they are interested in. As I cover these, I also want to answer some of the questions um, that have come in. So Barbara had asked, do you think that trips to third world countries might be a go by the fall or is it first world countries only um, that we think of going to? And that's a really excellent question. Um, it, it's very interesting to denote the third world versus the, the first world because some of the countries that we think of as third world um, have actually shown themselves to have fairly robust uh, public health programs because they're accustomed to dealing with, um, with epidemics in their own country. So for example, Rwanda, we had a trip scheduled um, there in 2020 and it did have to be canceled, but uh, we were very impressed with the Rwanda government and their 
swift um, move to implement protocols to minimize the spread of, of COVID at the time that the pandemic um, launched. So it really will be decided on a case by case basis. And, um, and it's important to note that, you know, you have to look at what the circumstances are in the country, but more importantly, what infrastructure and protocols do they have in place um, to assure us that they're going to be able to meet our standards. So uh, that's really the best that I could answer for, um, for third world. You know, if you look at first world, for example, uh, the UK has at times been in very bad shape and at other times been okay. Uh, and if we look at Israel, uh, which is the kind of the star story in the news these days, it's, it's pretty much the same thing right now. Israel is showing as the model for vaccination um, and approaching herd immunity. And several months back, you know, there was a sort of a huge um, backtracking that happened in Israel with their numbers rising. So it's very much of a move tar moving target right now. It's hard to predict whether third world or first world will be better. But what I will say is those six criteria that I presented in the beginning are what we're looking at for every single destination um, that we're highlighting. So I see a question coming in. I just wanted to check the chat so that I can make sure that I answer it. Um, so Dalam is stating that interested in combining the Camino de Santiago trip and the origins of man trip um, and that the dates do overlap. And it's really unfortunate. It's been quite a challenge for our tour companies to um, find new dates for programs like the origins of man, which was scheduled to take place in 2020. And so there's been a lot of sort of juggling of dates to get things together. But what I will say is if you're interested in combining both trips, um, please do give us a call. And that's something that we can possibly work out a transfer of transportation to get you um, out of one group earlier or caught up with the other group late. And we can work out the pricing to make that work for you, Dalam, if, if you're interested. I wanna share in the chat um, my phone number so that any of you who want to reach out to me can contact me directly. Um, I imagine that may be a bit of an unconventional thing to do. This is my cell phone number, but there's a pandemic going on after all. And, I've, and none of us are in the office and we haven't been since March. So um, if you need to reach a live human being, that is my phone number. If I don't answer, it's because I'm in a meeting and I will get back to you as soon as I can. You can also feel free to text me at that number. Um, so Mari, you asked whether or not we could address group size, especially on a cruise. How can you um, divide people up for sightseeing off the ship? How comfortable will solo travelers be? Uh, I want to address the solo travelers issue first. Um, solo travelers are always welcome on all of our programs. And um, when it comes to cruising, it can be kind of tricky because um, there are things like dining schedules and uh, uh, excursion plans that tend to work in round numbers. But that is the reason why we have excellent guides. We have faculty hosts. Um, oftentimes faculty are traveling with their spouses and they take extra care to make sure that solo travelers are never dining alone, um, are never on sightseeing tours without someone to talk to and someone to share experiences with. Um, and likewise, uh, when it comes to cabins. There are generally cabins available in our allotments for solo travelers. They tend to go fast. Um, some tour companies do charge single supplements, and that's not something we have a lot of control over. Um, if you ever see cruises offered by AHI, that tour company does tend to, um, to have trips that waive the single supplement, so we try to work with them on some of those. But again, Mari, if you have questions about that and you, you want some reassurance, please do feel free to call me and we can um, chat through some of your questions and concerns. Talking about solo travelers, this one is actually a really great trip for solo travelers, Albania and Northern Greece, October 7th through 19th, 2021. So that's this fall. Um, uh, 
oh, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. But if you if you've been to Greece, you know what a beautiful country it is. But many, many people have never been to northern Greece and many people have never been to Albania. And we're working with a specialist company in this region um, who has put together an incredible uh, itinerary of sites to see. Particularly in Northern Greece, you have the UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Meteora, which are the monasteries that are built on the top of these dramatic um, cliffs. And that's one of those, I think, bucket list experiences to see. So uh, this is one that's a land program. There's plenty of space for singles on it. Uh, and there are a lot of sort of intrepid and adventurous people who have signed up for this program. So, um, so I would suggest considering that one, Maury. Uh, Glenn asks, if the itineraries are, when are itineraries posted online? This is a great question, Glenn. Um, generally, we are planning a year and a half ahead of time. So right now, even we're considering our 2023 plans. And that reminds me, if you have um, things you'd like to see and do in 2023, please feel free to email us. Um, at alumniacademy at yale.edu and let us know where you want to go because I'm very interested in planning programs to places that you want to go. Um, if there are any faculty members that you would like to see leading a program, please share that as well. Um, so we're planning 2023. Our itineraries are placed online as they get confirmed with our tour partners. Um, and that tends to be on a rolling basis. So for 2021, the majority of the itineraries are online um, and they are being added each day. For 2022, we haven't yet really drilled down on the specifics of the new itineraries. So you can expect in general that about nine months out, we'll have enough information to post the itineraries online. And as you can imagine, we've got lots of catching up to do from the pandemic. So we are working feverishly to get all those itineraries together as we speak. Um, if you have questions, please do feel free to email us. You know, if you're looking at a particular trip and you want to know the itinerary, oftentimes we can give you some answers um, to your specific questions because we have early draft itineraries that just aren't ready for public consumption, but can be shared with you. Um, Francis says, I'm hoping you will talk a little about the Morocco trip. Sorry, Francis, that I, um, I didn't plan to talk in detail about the Morocco trip because I had so many um, questions that I wanted to cover and uh, examples of trips that I wanted to share with you. But I will take your name down and I will send you um, one of the early itineraries for the Morocco trip. Very happy to do that. Uh, another trip that I'm really excited about is this fabled rail journey of Wales and Scotland this October. Some of you who know me may know that I have an expertise in Wales. I spent um, eight years working for the Welsh government as their uh, tourism board director for North America. So I've been to Wales um, over a dozen times, all parts of the country. And it's one of those places that I know you um, those of you uh, who've traveled a lot extensively with Yale, uh, call me and tell me I've been everywhere in the world. And I say, have you been to Wales? And most people say, I have not. Um, so this one is a really wonderful uh, trip. It covers Wales and Scotland, and it gets you a chance to see the scenery um, because you're, you have two nights on the historic um, Bellman rail train in, in Scotland. Um, and then you have a, a couple of ground transfers that happen in Wales and Scotland. And so you get to you know, walk around and see the beauty of the landscape, a number of the historic sites, the museums, enjoy the culture, and then you get this um, really exclusive luxury rail experience as well. I think I saw another question come in. Uh, I love the idea of the theater tours. Are there tours where we might read a book, fiction or otherwise that might be connected with a specific area along with someone to guide us through region and reading? Thank you for that question. Um, that is exactly the premise of Alumni Academy is putting together um, educational opportunities for us to really explore in depth 
before the trip so that by the time we get to the trip, we've been sort of immersed a little bit in the themes and the culture and the, the folklore, et cetera, of the destination. So, um, so yes, there will be some tours. It's not all of them because we are doing 40 plus trips in 2022. So it will be hard to, um, to organize learning programs for all of those trips. But um, in some cases, for example, with the Japan trip, that we spotlighted earlier, um, we'll have a full reading list well in advance of the trip. Uh, and we have been working on a, a, a program format called Academy Conversations, which is alumni reading groups where we get together kind of like a book club and we work our way through the reading list um, leading up to the trip. So we'll, we will be offering some Alumni Academy Conversations groups in partnership with some of the trips. And I'm very happy to share that for 2023, we are working with a number of professors who are putting together um, online courses and lectures that will be paired with travel programs. So look out for that. And then lastly, um, even right now, there are some virtual tours on our site that are tying to travel programs. So there's a virtual tour to Morocco. We'll be releasing a lecture on that tour uh, in June. And there is a virtual tour to um, uh, Chile that also features a lot of content related to the tour. Um, there's a virtual tour to the UAE, Oman, Qatar, Dubai. Uh, and there is, there's one more that, I'm, that I will remember in just a minute to share with you. Oh, the Civil Rights Virtual Tour, um, which is a four part series and ties to the Civil Rights Program in 2022. So those are also places to go for learning related to the travel programs. Uh, before you, you go. Another trip that I'm really excited about sharing with you is Madagascar and Mauritius aboard the island Sky. This is a cruise taking place this December. Um, and again, Madagascar and Mauritius are, it's one of those regions of the world, um, the, the Indian Ocean that people just have not been to. And um, a lot of effort, careful planning has gone into putting this together. The faculty leader for this program is a man called David Myers who graduated from the School of Management and he is not on the Yale faculty as a professor. Um, he is a businessman who has a, an academic background in studying lemurs, um, a professional background in uh, operating a um, a harvesting business in Madagascar and has a number of years living on the ground in Madagascar. So he is just a gem, a wealth of knowledge, both on the naturalist side and on the economic side um, for all the kinds of things you could think of regarding traveling to Madagascar and Mauritius. So I'm really excited about this program. Um, and I hope that it's something that you will consider if you've ever had any curiosities in this region of the world. Uh, Anne is asking if we have an upcoming tour of Russia. Um, and we had a tour that was planned to go to Russia in July of this summer, and it has been po postponed. Um, and we are working on new dates for summer of 2022. It's called Waterways of Russia. We do plan to offer that. Um, it's confirmed. It's just that the dates are not confirmed. It had to be postponed because the borders in Russia are not yet uh, open to Americans. So that is a planned tour coming up. And Let's see, uh, um, someone has asked if I will detail the Albania and Greece trip today. Um, I, you know, I think I have covered most of the, uh, the last one that I wanted to cover was just to mention, these are all highlights. So just to mention briefly, um, Antarctica. So I, I didn't have plans to um, detail the Albania and Greece trip today, um, but I'm happy to go through the itinerary and share with those of you who want to stay on and see more about it. Um, we're just coming up to, yep, a uh, quarter after, so that was the time that we had planned for our webinar today, but I don't mind staying on if you want to talk more about Albania and Greece. Uh, I want to just check. Um, okay, so Robert has asked if we plan another Footsteps of St. Paul. And the answer to that is yes, we do have a Footsteps of St. Paul 
planned for 2022. That is on our Alumni Academy website. And I will show you how to find that, um, Robert, just in a moment. We're still working on the itinerary for that. Um, and we have a number of people who are holding credits for the Footsteps of St. Paul tour. So uh, that was supposed to take place in March of 2020. And so we have been working very diligently with Criterion, which is our tour operator, to make sure that we're able to offer um, the same or better itinerary and the same or better accommodations. And I'm happy to confirm that that has been put together. Um, we're still working on the details, the final details of the itinerary and putting together the, um, the brochure. And so those of you who were on the original Footsteps of St. Paul itinerary in Turkey will be the first to be notified um, so that you can reserve your spaces first before that tour goes out to everyone else. Uh, okay. Um, I am seeing questions coming in and just want to make sure that I answer everyone's questions. I also wanted to mention this um, trip to Antarctica in January of 2022. So originally we had planned to take people um, to Antarctica to see the uh, eclipse in December, but we had to make an early decision on that um, at the beginning of this year. And because in January, we just weren't certain what was going to unfold with the vaccine process and so forth, we decided not to offer the Antarctica trip this December. And we're offering it in January. Now we've been able to um, be more confident of the process that's unfolding. And so in March, we confirmed new dates for our Antarctica program in January of 2022. This was a really popular, um, destination on our website, we were able to see by March that there were many people who were interested in Antarctica. So I wanted to share with you to please take a look and consider this trip. There will be more information, as I mentioned earlier, being posted about all of these trips, um, updated really every couple of days because we are very actively getting all of, all of the trip details up and running. So uh, I'll just direct you to our website is alumniacademy.yale.edu. I've seen most of the questions coming through. One of you has already texted me, so no problem to do that. And I'll respond to the text after this is over. Um, for those who were interested in um, the person who asked about Greece and Albania, I will go over that. And there was another question. Um, yeah, and I'll just show you how to find the footsteps of St. Paul trip on our website. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And um, Julie says uh, that my head must be spinning with all of the decisions. Julie, it has been an intense year of decisions. If I was ambivalent about decision-making before this year, I am no longer ambivalent about decision-making. Um, it's been really a trial by fire to try to take care of all the choices that we have, um, have had to make with regard to these travel programs. But I, I did wanna give the presentation today because I really do feel confident at this point that um, we have the right set of circumstances to, um, to be able to confidently tell you uh, about what is happening with travel and to be able to, to offer you opportunities to travel that I feel are going to be safe, safe and worthwhile. Okay, so for those who want to see more about Albania and Northern Greece, and just to see where to find things on our website, I'm sharing the screen about our website. I'm gonna go back to the homepage that you will see when you go to alumniacademy.yale.edu. And I'll just show you how to find um, tour programs on the website. So when you land on our home, you this uh, Chichita, Mexico pyramid and click discover your next adventure. You will find uh, our landing page for our travel preview 2021 and 2022. And on this landing page are all of the trips 
And as I said, we're updating them rapidly as we confirm them. So if we wanted to know about, um, actually someone asked earlier about the Middle East. So I wanted to highlight um, the Morocco program that I mentioned earlier, the Africa programs, and then um, Dubai, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, and Oman is planned for the winter of 2022. So that's, I think, January or February-ish. We will be um, offering that program and stay tuned for more details on that. It's a really exciting one. Um, here's the Japan in winter that we saw Professor Ed Kamens tell us about earlier, the Footsteps of St. Paul program that was asked about just a few moments ago. So that's all on our site in the Asia section. And then if we, um, I'm just going to scroll back to the top so that I can sort of quickly get to Europe. And going through Europe, I am looking for Albania and Northern Greece. Here is the program. And this will give you a chance as well just to see how our new website is set up. So this is the landing page for the trip. And on the new website, you have going across the center um, these menu options, which will allow you to find out a lot about the trip as much as is a, is we have available at the time that you visit. Um, in general, once a trip is posted here uh, on this section of our website, the itinerary is available. And the um, accommodations tab, we update as soon as we have it. So we're still pulling in accommodations for this trip. Um, the faculty will have a bio of the faculty members. And in the brochure, you can um, scroll down, you choose your region, and you find the list, uh, you find your trip listing there, and then you can select. And as you can see, even though you're on the Albania and Northern Greece, it lists all of the trips in Europe. So you can select from one place any brochures that you would like to, um, to have sent to you once they're available. So let's just go over the itinerary for Albania and Northern Greece. You can see here, I'm gonna try to enlarge it. You can see um, the map. And you're basically starting in Tirana, the capital of Albania, and making your way south into northern Greece. And then you finish on this trip um, in Thessaloniki, where it, you, that's your departure. Um, it's a connecting flight to Athens or connecting flight to your onward journey city. And so that's kind of um, just a quick sense of what the trip is all about. Uh, I have not traveled to Albania, so I don't know as much about this um, portion of the trip, but if there is a lot of interest in it, I'm certainly happy to put together another webinar where we can talk about the history of Albania. I actually think that would be a great idea because how many of us know um, really a lot about the history of Albania? Uh, but on this trip, you have uh, a nice substantial time in Albania, about four days there. And I wanna highlight, uh, because it's always important to note when you're visiting the world, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, those are the places in a country that you really want to um, make sure that you see when you're visiting. So uh, you go from the capital and then you get out into the countryside. And the nice thing about this trip is that you have a balance of city, and small town village life. Um, so I encourage you to go through, uh, to go through this itinerary um, and compare some of the, the things that you're seeing. You are also getting to see a number of the archeological sites. So you, you can't really go to this part of the world without doing um, history and archeology. span um, and of course the food is, is excellent, but I, I do wanna highlight that there, we're going to be seeing a number of the archeological sites on this trip. Um, and then passing into, passing the border from Albania into Greece. Um, and this Vika Scourge is a, a huge natural landmark. Um, it's one of the steepest gorges 
of any in the world. And you saw the picture earlier, so you can't really imagine how dramatic the scenery is um, when you're in this northern part of Greece. Um, part of the reason why it it is a sight to see is because it was a place where monks in Greece traveled and they built their monasteries on the top of these um, gorges. And Meteora is what uh, one of the areas is called because it has the, the sense that um, that these natural um, rock formations are reaching up to the sky. So you have um, places where you have hundreds and hundreds of steps. And I, I hesitate to say hundreds and hundreds of steps because you don't have to walk them. Um, but it's part of the, uh, the reason why the region is a UNESCO World Heritage Site is just the sheer um, accomplishment of building these incredible monasteries. The other thing about this part of Greece, the northern region of Greece, is that the culture, the heritage um, is completely different from what it is in other parts of Greece. And so it, it really is a, a region that goes, takes you back in time to a, a different way of life in the Greece in the Greek history. So, um, and then when you end the tour, you're in Thessaloniki, which is one of the major cosmopolitan cities in Greece. And so again, on this tour, you have a really nice mix of the very traditional heritage, the small towns, you're gonna get to meet the local people um, and enjoy, you know, a meal in a taverna, um, a meal in a, in a home. Uh, visit with local people, and then you get to um, immerse yourself in the archaeology and the history, seeing the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, as well as experiencing um, some of the modern cities. So it's a really nice uh, combination of a wide variety of factors. And I'm sorry that I didn't really prepare a full presentation, but I'm happy to do that now that I know that there's interest at a later date. So um, please do be on the lookout for emails from Alumni Academy. Uh, we're trying to send them out once a week um, to, just to let you know the mix of things from new travel programs to free lectures to online courses that you can sign up for. Uh, I'm going to wrap up, just check and make sure that there's no more questions. Okay, so Shirley wants to know, will the trip to Qatar, Abu Dhabi, et cetera, be land or cruise? How large will the group be? Thank you, Shirley, for that question. Um, group size on all of our programs tends to be 25, 30 max. Um, I'm gonna guess that with this one, the group may be a little bit smaller. So I would anticipate no more than 20 in that group. Uh, it is planned as a cruise. Um, but we are still confirming the details of that. So it may be transferred over to a land program. So that this one is one that's early, um, still early for us. And we're still working out the details with the tour company. So if you're interested, Shirley, um, what I would suggest is, and I'll show everyone, when you go to the, um, so I'm back on the home page of our website and when you click discover your next adventure here next to the pyramid. If you, and it has not been built out with a registration page yet, when you click on it, it will take you to um, a form that you can complete to find out more information about the trip. And so if you would kindly, um, Shirley, complete this form, put your name and your email address. Once we have all the details confirmed and the itinerary together, we will send that to you and you will be amongst the first notified about the trip. And that is the case for all of the programs here. You're either going to be able to find your way to a registration page, um, as in this Japan trip, that I hope I just clicked on. Let's see. Um, so you'll either be able to find your way to a registration page where you'll find a brochure request tab on the registration page. So here's the registration page for Japan. And here you have a brochure request tab. And from here you would go in, select Asia, click the box complete your information and hit submit. 
and then you'll be notified um, as soon as there is more information available or brochure available. Where there is not a registration page for the trip yet, as in the Middle East trip, then you would find this form. But it basically does the same thing, which it puts you on a list for us that we will use to notify everyone who wants to get early information about the trip. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, let's see, there was one more question, I think, and I'll just stay on until all the questions are finished. I'm just checking the chat. Nancy asks, I've never been on one of your trips. What is the usual include, exclude, list, meals, airfare, et cetera? Great question, Nancy, um, and welcome. I'm so glad that you signed up for this webinar to learn more about traveling with us. Uh, the first thing that I wanna say, if you've never been on one of our trips, is that we really want this to be a um, traveling with friends and family and, and collegial peers experience. And so that's why I'm doing this webinar. I wanted to give you all an opportunity to meet me. I wanted to give you my phone number, my email, so that you can contact me when you have questions. And I really want you to feel like you have a personal connection to us here at Yale. Um, even if you're not an alum, you are welcome to travel with us as friends and family. Uh, in terms of the typical include, exclude list, usually uh, there is a proportion of meals included. Generally on cruises, that's most meals um, that take place on the ship. And there may be a, a few meals, two or three that happen off the ship or where you're, you know, you have a day um, on your own, it, depending on where you're going. So uh, in, you find that out when you get the brochure and the brochure tends to have a, a border on one edge that shows you all the things that are included and all of the things that are excluded. But typically we are negotiating on your behalf. Um, a majority of meals are included. Generally um, alcoholic beverages may not be included, but where there are group dinners, we try to include, particularly on land trips, we try to include, for example, one glass of wine with dinner. Um, airfare is almost never included on our travel programs. And there are some tour companies that include airfare. Um, if you're traveling with other organizations outside of Yale. The reason why um, we have tended to move away from the trips that include airfare is because we found that a lot of times the flight itineraries were not great um, and, and involved a lot of transfers or flying on uh, routes that you would not really want to want to go. Um, there was a level of complication to it. And we found that a lot of alumni were actually once they bought those trips and traveled on the flights, not so happy about it. Um, so we have sort of changed course and we generally do not include airfare. Now, occasionally, for example, with a trip like Antarctica, there may be a flight that is included. Um, there was one Antarctica itinerary that we were previously going to do in 2020, and it included a flight from Florida there was a Cuba trip that we did that included a flight from Florida. So periodically you may find um, that kind of flight. Now, once you're on the trip in the country, any in-country transfers are included. So for example, in Egypt, you need to fly from Cairo to Aswan, that flight is included. So that is on your inclusions list. Um, also, the tips, the gratuities, those are always included. We negotiate that on your behalf. Um, all of your touring is included. So if you're on a cruise um, and you wanna do option A excursion versus option B excursion, all of the options of your excursions are included. Once you go on the trip, you're really only paying out of pocket for your alcoholic beverages, your meals on your own, and any kind of, um, souvenirs that you want to buy, but all of the programming content main experiences are included each day. Uh, let's see. Um, I hope that answers your question, Nancy. Let me know if there were any more details that you wanted to ask about. And I thought I saw one more question in the chat. Is the London Theatre Program in October all set? Ask Bill. Yes, we do have a London theater program uh, happening planned for October. 
the same terms would apply that I presented in the beginning, just in terms of how we're making decisions to go forward with that program. From what we can see right now, we expect that it will operate. Um, Murray Biggs is signed on to lead that. We don't have more information yet because the theater uh, organizations in London are like all the rest of us now that we understand that uh, opening again is going to be possible. The theaters in London are looking at what their uh, programming and content is going to be. So uh, there's still some time that we'll need to gather that information. For those of you who might be on this call who have been um, signed on to 2020 departures for the theater programs, we have uh, gotten together with Murray Biggs to organize um, a special event for you. And so please do be on the lookout for your emails. I'm preparing information that I will be sharing um, about that. And that's for the people who registered for London and plan to travel last year and have not been able to travel yet. Murray wants to offer some special um, programming for you. So um, Bill, if you had been previously registered, please do be on the lookout for that. I think I have answered all the questions. Um, okay, just any more questions going once? I think we've covered, I think we've covered everything. I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, I'll just, for those of you who are still on or those of you who may be watching this on demand later, I will share um, that the best way to reach me is to is actually to email alumni academy at yale.edu. Um, and you may also call or text. My number is Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate the chance to meet all of you virtually. I hope to meet you on a travel program or here on Yale's campus one day. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.